What you're about to listen to is part two of a multiple episode series regarding the Second World War. Now, if you happen to be the kind of person that can pick up in the middle of a story and be able to listen in, then by all means, keep on listening. If you're more like me and you want to make sure that you get the full picture, I'd encourage you to go back and listen to the previous episode, part one. It'll help you develop a fuller understanding of what this episode is diving into and ensure that you're not caught up in the middle of a story that has led you to have no idea what's going on. And I think that most people aren't able to understand the full picture without getting the complete contextual backdrop of what they're talking about. And I can hardly think of a story that requires more context, more background, and more explanation than that of World War II. At the very least, if you go back and listen carefully to the first episode, you'll be able to listen to me use the same quote twice without realizing I had already done so. So that might be worth it on its own, but it's too late now. This is part two of the series, and it picks up just before the Allied invasion of Normandy, France, marking the beginning of the end for the Axis powers. So, without any further ado, this is part two of the World War II series on the Monday American, titled Into the Jaws of Death. I hope you enjoy. It's the show that blends past with present and creates common sense. The show made for the people, by the people. You're listening to The Monday American. June 6, 1944. It marks the day that the United States landed on the beaches of Normandy, France, along with the British, Australian, and Canadian forces, amongst a few others, to engage in battle with the Nazi Wehrmacht army. No one knew just what they were getting into. Now, in the previous episode, we spent some time talking about the Allied preparations for the just monstrosity of this invasion and how big it was, how much planning that it involved, and that was equally as much planning as the Germans were doing in anticipation of this Allied landing force. And I think one of the things that is most impeccable about this this D-Day landing in Normandy is that the American invasion force was up against all odds. So we spent a lot of time talking about all these preparations that were so carefully planned. People were pushing wooden scaled ships around on floors to see if things fit. I mean, it was down to the details and just about every single thing that could have gone wrong did go wrong. And it was still a militarily successful invasion of France. Here is what the invading force was up against. Hitler had plenty of time to construct a massive fortification for the invasion that he knew was coming, and that was called the Atlantic Wall. It was a wall that spanned the coastline of France because they knew they had to come through that way, of fortifications, pillboxes, It was beaches that had zeroed-in machine guns and artillery. It was massive guns that could keep ships away. It was one of the most impressive defensive fortifications the world had ever seen, and the United States and the Allied powers knew that that was their only way through. So how do you plan an invasion knowing that that's what you're up against? That seems like suicide, and for all intents and purposes, it was a suicide mission. Most of these men did not expect to make it out alive. That can be said for almost everyone who knew that they were going to be in the invasion, the first wave. They they were set. They pretty much knew that they were goners from the get-go. And actually, a lot of them made it, miraculously, because they were pinned down for a what I'm sure seemed like an eternity under constant machine gun fire, seeking shelter in bomb craters and with anti-tank barriers, And that was if they made it through the mines, which were all over the beach. 
And on top of that, the Americans and the Allied forces had the worst luck that you could possibly have when facing an invasion like this. Operation Overlord is what it was called. They chose this area because it was supposed to be lightly fortified and it was supposed to be lightly manned. So they chose this strip of beach knowing that it was going to be lightly defended, but what they didn't know is that shortly before they got there, Hitler had sent a group from the front lines who were battle-wearied but veteran fighters who could fight ferociously because they had been doing it for a long, long time. They were all there. No one was expecting the Americans to come, but if Hitler had any chance of fending off this invasion, those were the troops that he would have wanted there, and by sheer happenstance, they happened to be there. Not only that, but the weather played a crucial part in the invasion landings. You have to remember that there was roughly a four or five foot tide that they had to deal with, which if you drop those men off too far outside of where they need to be, they are running for, I think it was some something like 200 yards without a single bit of cover, and they're just going to get mowed down. Unfortunately, the tide was extremely low because of a storm, so that is what happened. These men got cut to pieces by machine gun fire, mortar fire, and artillery fire, and snipers. They got brutally murdered. Many of them would get killed before they could even step out of the boat. Some boats, if they even made it to shore, were just, as soon as they opened the door, riddled with bullets, and no one made it out alive. But before we get too far into the gruesome stories and the personal accounts of what it was like to be there that day, you have to understand that the Allies had a very specific plan that hinged nearly entirely on a sole two divisions, the 82nd and 101st Airborne. So the general plan for the invasion went like this. You had so many thousands of men going onto a beach that had been prepared for their arrival with mines and every nasty thing that you could possibly fathom, and they were just going to have to bear through it. So, in order to buy them some time, we had to drop the 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions, which are parachuting soldiers, behind enemy lines. Now, a paratrooper was almost an insane person back then because these were the first paratroopers to ever serve in the military. Most of them didn't know what a paratrooper was when they signed up for it. They got a couple extra bucks a month for it. Uh, I remember hearing one interview in a documentary where he said, well, they told me it was the craziest uh, soldier there was, and I figured I wanted to be the best and the craziest, so I signed up for it. Then I found out I had to jump out of a plane. I mean, these guys were, these were young kids. These were young men, and there were so many dangers ahead of them, not to mention they were jumping behind enemy lines. They were completely surrounded and cut off and in the middle of the night. So the plan hinged on these airborne divisions jumping behind enemy lines the night before so that they could be there when the German reinforcements arrived to the beach to stop them from going straight to the beach. Or else every single soldier and every ship, tank, jeep, and every radio on that beach would have been destroyed and the war would have been over right there and I'd probably be speaking German right now. But nevertheless, these men were able to pull it off. So a long column of 800 airplanes that ferried 13,000 American paratroopers to battle was on its way to Normandy, France. They flew south. They flew low. They hugged the water of the Inky Channel and turning sharply to the east to climb between the islands of... And let me go ahead and say this now. Uh, there's a lot of French towns and French names and French language in this episode, and I'm going to absolutely butcher and destroy the language. I apologize for my pronunciation, so feel free to laugh at my pronunciation, and I am sorry for uh, ruining what is a very pretty language. But they flew between the islands of Guernsey and Alderney. Dead ahead in the moonlight was the Continent Peninsula. It was famed for its cattle um, and stiff with Germans. The jump masters in the planes, they barked above the engines, ordering the men to their feet. 
with a pretentious click, 16 or 17 jumpers, depending on the size of the plane, in each bay would snap their parachutes to static running lines overhead. And shortly after 1 a.m. on Tuesday, June 6, 1944, a captain standing in the slipstream of an open doorway peered down at the white surf beating against a beach. Quote, Say hello to France, he shouted. Red lights flashed to warn that the four minutes ahead lay the drop zone. Three tight ovals for the 101st Airborne Division, who was leading the attack, and then three more for the 82nd Airborne, who was close behind. And then suddenly, France vanished. There was a cloud bank, and it was so thick that pilots could barely see their own wingtips. It swallowed planes and whole groups of planes. Formations started disintegrating as the C-47 Dakotas climbed and dove to avoid colliding from each other. There were dark patches of earth that would swim up and then disappear, and then suddenly the German anti-aircraft fire began. One GI said it was like, quote, so many lighted tennis balls. It began to rip into the clouds. There were searchlights and magnesium flares that were drenching cockpits, and it was it was causing these pilots to lurch left and right despite orders forbidding any kind of evasive maneuver. Enemy tracers, says one soldier, that were thick enough to walk on. They stitched the sky, one paratrooper reported, and shells blew through aluminum skins as if someone threw a keg of nails against the side of an airplane. Three GIs died when a smoking two-foot hole opened in the fuselage. A dozen others were so entangled after slipping on the vomit-slick floor that they would return to England without even jumping. And even as the cloud bank thinned to the east, there were bewildered crewmen who mistook one French village for another. And you have to remember, these villages all looked the same, especially at night, especially in that scenario. Now, there was a plan in case of something like this, and they had what they called pathfinders. And these pathfinders, they jumped an hour before the rest of these men got there, but they even were so lost that they were, they were misleading the rest of them. They were using electronic transmitters and I think seven or eight signal lamps that were arranged in a T formation um, or else they found enemy troops uh, infesting the ground and they never made it. Um, The green jump lights began to flash in the aircraft anyways because they had to dump these troops out somewhere. Some of them flashed their lights too soon and they dumped howling paratroopers into the sea to their death. Cargo bundles got stuck in aircraft doors, delaying a lined-up troop for two miles or more. Other planes failed to descend to the specified jump height of 500 feet or to slow to 110 miles an hour. Parachutes would rip open with such violent G-force that, quote, anything in my jump pants pocket simply burst through the reinforced bottom seams, a trooper remembers. Rations, grenades, underwear... They actually had carrier pigeons with them to send messages. They all spilled into the night. Gunfire from the ground, it thickened like, quote, a wall of flame. Rather than half a minute instead of what it was supposed to take to get down, quote, the trip down took a thousand years, a private later told his family. One chute snagged on a vertical stabilizer of a plane, dragging the flailing jumper into the night. And he may be one of the lucky ones because eventually he was set free, but he probably didn't make it. Who knows? Who knows? There were so many people with so many different stories. And probably one of the worst was these parachuters because of all these fires and all of these airplanes. And the vast majority of them had some type of damage or fire that they were taking. And these men were jumping with parachute made of silk. One soldier was hurtling earthwards beneath burning shreds of silk. This is a gruesome story. Men in parachutes that failed to open hit the ground with a sound likened by one soldier to, quote, watermelons falling off the back of a truck. One soldier tells the story about the trip down, and you have to remember they had no controls. They were just landing wherever they landed. I pulled up my knees to make myself as small a target as possible. In the 507th Parachute Infantry, he wrote, I pulled on my risers to try to slip away from the fire. Flames licked through the cabin of a gunshot C-47 as frantic soldiers would dive out of the door before the plane would just turn over onto a left wing and stall and crash. Most of the jumpers survived from that. The crew, they did not. 
a burning building near saint Colm du mont gave German defenders enough illumination to fatally shoot a battalion commander, his chief XO, executive officer, and a company commander before they even touched France. Three other company commanders were captured. The operation for the 101st Airborne was called Operation Albany. It was separated from the 82nd, who had a different operation, which we'll go through in a minute. It was intended to seize four elevated causeways. They were each roughly a mile apart, and they all led from Utah Beach to the Continent Interior. American planners knew that the marshlands behind the sea dunes had been flooded with about two to four feet of water by German engineers who dammed a bunch of streams and stuff like that. But what they did not know is that the enemy inundations were in fact far more ambitious. They flooded that way more than four or five feet. They flooded that like its own tiny ocean. They were doing it since the beginning of late 1942. They opened floodgates and they allowed tidal surges to create an inland sea 10 miles long and up to 10 feet deep. The reeds and marsh grass that were now in them were so dense that of the 1 million aerial photo- photographs snapped by the Allied reconnaissance planes, none of them have, had revealed that flooding. And no one was more surprised about the flooding than the flailing paratroopers who, upon arriving over the coast of France, had removed their life vests in the airplane bays only to be pulled to brackish graves by their heavy, heavy kits. And that was just the first three hours. Just at 4 a.m., as thousands and thousands of lost and scattered parachutists blundered about in the dark, the first 52 gliders arrived. Now, the gliders are exactly what they sound like. They were a new invention in in airfare, and they were made to carry jeeps and things that could get materials inland quickly. They were quiet and they were cheap, and they were quick to build. The problem was, as one soldier says, they were so flimsy you could, quote, shoot an arrow through it. The first 52 gliders arrived, and a captain even admitted that they didn't have hardened nose caps that were ordered back in February, but they would cut loose from a tow plane, and they would just drift down to Earth, piloted by pilots who had rarely, if ever, even flown at night, who were feeling for the ground that they couldn't even see while bullets were puncturing the glider's fabric. One soldier said it sounded like a typewriter key banging on loose paper. Some found the landing zone near Blawville. Others found stone walls, tree trunks, dozing livestock, or the pernicious anti-glider stakes known as Rommel's asparagus. And they knew it was coming, the Germans did, so they put up pretty much what you would think of as the primitive defense of a castle with sharpened logs that were sticking out of the ground just waiting for a glider to catch its mark. All eight men and one of the 101st Airborne surgical team were killed in a crash. Uh, One of them came down and it smashed into a tree, breaking the legs of a pilot, killing the co-pilot in the cargo bay as if he was taking a nap in a jeep. Uh, The 101st Assistant Division Commander, Brigadier General Don F. Pratt, He died from a broken neck. Survivors of these glider crashes, because that's what they all did, they just crashed to the ground as as gently as they could. They would just kick through the glider fabric. One German soldier remembers it, quote, like bees out of a hive they came from that hole. And they, they began to salvage the small parts and medical supplies that were now on Norman soil. Of more than 6,000 jumpers from the 101st Airborne, Barely 1,000 had landed on or near the H-hour objectives on this Tuesday morning. Most of the 1,500-odd who had drifted far beyond the 8-mile square enclosing the division drop zones would be killed or captured. A few would make their way from, from, from danger to safety with maps that they took from locals or from telephone books by farmers. Uh, more than half of all their supply bundles lay beyond retrieval at the bottom of various water meadows, and they had a devastating loss of radios, mortars, and 11 of their 12 75mm howitzer guns. A sergeant peering into a barn found, quote, men lying in straw wrapped in bloody soiled parachutes, their faces darkened and bandages stained. But these men, who were long celebrated to just press on, they, they found a way to do it. 
the the local French did help them out when they could. The 101st commander, Major General Taylor, was wandering into the dark with a gimpy leg and a drawn pistol and collecting paratroopers when he could find them, and he politely declined the offer from a local French farmer who said, Allez me terre un beau. And I, I'm sure that's not even correct French, but it meant go kill me a German. And we'll get into more of what these locals had to deal with, with these invading Germans. But you have to remember, these Germans were raping their way through Europe. And so were the Russians. We'll get there. But all of these French, they hated their captors. And I love that story where a German, I'm sorry, a French local farmer sees a captain and just tries to give him a rifle and just says, go kill me a German. I, I just think that's a fascinating story that these people had been through so much. They just wanted some form of retribution. And looking back on it in hindsight, it's 2020. You should never ask someone, go kill me someone. But these people were in a world we can never understand and we will never know. And I think the biggest part of history is putting yourself in someone else's shoes. It's not revising history. It's understanding where they were coming from. These people had been through one of the worst tragedies, two of the worst tragedies that will ever plague our earth as far as humans are on it. And they went through both of them within 20 years. I cannot even imagine what kind of stress and what kind of mental exhaustion and just horrific things had been going on in these people's lives. I don't think I would have done anything differently. I would have handed him a gun and said, go get me one too. I don't think anyone would have done anything differently because these Nazi, the Wehrmacht was the army, the SS, that was the brutal, the brutal soldiers, the secret service essentially of Hitler who were just a, a murder squad. But after all that those paratroopers had been through, after that horrific night, that horrific jump that they had been training for for years at this point, Five hours after leaping into Normandy, they lined the sandy ridge overlooking the flooded marshes behind the dunes waiting for Force U to emerge from the sea. And one hour behind them was Operation Boston, the 82nd Airborne. For them, no objective was more important than Samir Iglis. And if you've seen Saving Private Ryan, I do believe that is a town featured in that movie. The division's 6,000 men swooped over Normandy, an hour behind the 101st Division. Roads from every compass point converged at that town, and the trunk cable linking Cherbourg in the north with Carentan in the south passed through Saint-Mir. Unless it held the town, the 82nd had, quote, almost no chance to sustain offensive operations across the Merdere River and to the westward, one regimental study concluded. So when the division drop zones were shifted late May, they tended to, pardon me, they tended to cluster around this medieval crossroads of a thousand souls. The drops in Operation Boston proved even more deranged than those of Operation Albany. Paratroopers were sifting to Earth as far as 15 miles north of their intended zones and 25 miles south. Those too far to the east and west would plunge into the Atlantic and never be seen again. Less than half of the following gliders landed within a mile of the landing zone, and many of them were demolished. They had dire losses of anti-tank guns and other heavy gear. Brigadier, Brigadier General Jim Gavin, who was the one who had fretted over the Little Bighorn repeat, he floated into an apple orchard and spent the entire night of June 6th with an M1 rifle in his hand, and he shoved scratch forces that he could find of troopers towards the critical Merdere Bridge at Saint-Merglis and Chef du Pont. Soldiers stripped naked in the moonlight to dive for equipment bundles in the fins. They, they found a German train that had been bushwhacked uh, in the station. All they could find was cheese and empty bottles. One gunfight along the river grew so frenzied that the paratroopers not only shot down enemy soldiers, but they also slaughtered livestock in a barn. A lieutenant leading a patrol, and this is where I think Rick, Rick Atkinson, he, he says it like none other. He tells the story of a lieutenant who led a patrol, bayoneted three wounded Germans on a dirt road that he found, and he said, quote, he felt like he could not take any prisoners, a unit report explained, quote, so he dispatched them. 
And then Rick Atkinson says, the wolf had risen in the heart already, which is one of the characteristics that makes World War II one of the most disgusting, nasty events in the course of human history. This war was fought with a brutal hatred for man and man, and it was used to justify some of the most disgusting things that the human race is capable of doing that we will ever see. And that is what makes the spirit of World War II so difficult but so important to understand. There was real hatred that these men fought with. And that is something that everyone needs to remember as they go through this. The entire Soviet Union army was encouraged by Stalin and their leaders to rape their way to Berlin as a payback. This was hatred unlike the world had ever seen. Back in the 82nd Division, only one of the division's three infantry regiments made the correct drop northwest of saint mer Eglise. A fire that perhaps was ignited by a, a flare had awakened both the town and the German garrison staying there, but it also gave some very brave pilots a way to see where they were, and what they did was they turned around and they swooped in and, and dumped out their soldiers close to it without any warning these c-47s just roared overhead this fire wingtip to wingtip spitting out paratroopers who were frantically tugging on their risers to shear away from both flames and german gunners a few gis were butchered in their harness including one young trooper who dangled from a tree who the mayor of samirigli says with eyes open as though looking down at his own bullet holes and that is just harrowing to think of but these men they had no control of their parachutes they were just jumping and the parachutes were getting them down safely they had to sit there in these white parachutes in the black night while these gunners just had at them and it took roughly a a minute to get down like that one soldier said it felt like a thousand years you were a sitting duck um They were told when they were supposed to land to avoid the telltale muzzle flashes by using only knives, bayonets, and grenades. These men were given a very difficult task and a very difficult psychological task. Once you survive this chaos, don't use muzzles, which means don't fire your weapon. Just use close close knives, bayonets, hand-to-hand combat grenades. Only 10 Germans died defending the town that they had held for four years. Most of them fled. Uh, A few hard sleepers were captured in their bunks, but 400 yards from the church square, Colonel Edward C. Krauss personally severed the cable, the the telephone cable to Cherbourg. Um, Patrols started building roadblocks, and a burial detail cut down a half dozen dead paratroopers still dangling from chestnut trees. At 5 a.m. in the morning, Colonel Kraus sent a runner since he had severed that cable and they had no radios. And the runner took a message that reached the division commander, who was Major General Matthew B. Ridgway. And the message said, I am in Samer Iglis. One hour later, a second runner carried a different message that said, I have secured Samer Iglis. And on the delivery of that second message marked the first town in France that the Americans had liberated. 816 planes and 100 gliders had inserted more than 13,000 GIs onto the continent. Surprisingly, only 21 of them had been shot down, far less than what was predicted by the air marshal. And truly, that is, considering the massive amount of Manpower, airplanes, and everything going on, that's that's a very small amount of airplanes get shot down. Um, the stories, though, of these men in this airplane, for example, uh, with the British 6th Airborne, they their job was basically to the west. They had two parachute brigades to secure Overlord, which was the code name for D, the whole D-Day operation. They were supposed to secure the left flank by seizing two bridges over the River Orne and its attendant canal, uh, northeast of the Caen, while blowing up spans of um, bridges across the river Dive, which flowed roughly parallel five miles farther east. Uh, most of these British pathfinders landed in the wrong place as well. 
Uh, their electronic beacons and signal lamps were broken. Uh, they were missing or they were just invisible. And evasive maneuvering from these airplanes knocked some paratroopers off balance, delayed their jumps. Uh, in one flock of 91 planes, only 17 dropped in the correct spot. An anti-aircraft shell, this story blows my mind. An anti-aircraft shell blew a hole in a fuselage of an airplane, and the major from the 3rd Brigade fell through the hole in the plane's fuselage. But he had the static line that he was hooked to from the parachute wrapped around his legs. He was dangling beneath the aircraft for half an hour until he was finally reeled back into the plane. He returned to England, and then later on that same day, made it back to France in a glider completely unharmed, which is unreal. But less fortunate were the men who were dumped into the Atlantic or flooded into the Div Valley. One brigadier took four hours to wade through the riverbank near Cape Ork, and while he was wading through that mess, he was actually steeping in the, I think it was 60 tea bags that he had sewn into his own battle dress while he was walking through. His quote is, quote, we could see where parachute canopies had collapsed in silken circles on the water, an officer reported. The crazy thing about this flood in this valley, bodies would be discovered in that muck for the next 50 years. And despite all those challenges and all of those unfortunate scenarios and circumstances, human error, human evil, somehow... By some divine miracle, they were able to take their objectives and they were ready to defend the Germans who were going to inevitably be reinforcing as the men on the beach were landing. And somehow they did it. And so the men of the 101st and the 82nd Airborne had finished the job that had been tasked to them. Now they were waiting on all those men that were coming by sea all the things about the D-Day landings, I always gravitate back to one question, regardless of what part of D-Day I'm actually thinking about. I always wonder what it was like to sit in that boat for the long ride over the channel and watch everything around you as it's happening. What would that feel like? How afraid would you have had to have been if that, if that was going to be you or if that was going to be if you were maybe going to be one of the last 15 or so to make it off a boat out of 40 or 50, there was uh, a picture I found earlier where it had two men who made it off of a boat of 30. Could you possibly fathom what that even felt like? That's what these soldiers felt nearly every single day. One soldier said about his experience on the naval ships, uh, he said it before the landing had begun, he said, fear is a passion like any other. And that passion is what gripped these men. They were consumed by this passionate type of fear that I don't even really know if I can adequately understand what that felt like. Uh, it was just a different a heightened sense. One of the doctors, one of the doctors on the on one of the ships, he confessed to drinking so much coffee, he said I was having extra systoles every fourth or fifth beat. The crazy part is he wasn't even nervous for for himself. He was nervous for those men. Another soldier said, The waiting is always the worst. The mind can wander. Now, these men weren't just fighting a, a physical enemy. They were fighting their own psyche from ripping them apart within. Rick Atkinson does a phenomenal job in his book, The Guns at Last Light, when he says, and I quote, waiting for battle induced the philosopher in every man. Mac, a young soldier in the 16th Infantry, asked a comrade, when a bullet hits you, does it go all the way through? These were young boys. The large majority of them were 18 and 20, and they were all about to jump off of a boat and onto a beach in order to carry out an operation where essentially the safety and security of the world rested on the shoulders of their success, or it would be drugged by their boots at failure. They were a bunch of boys, and how they handled themselves on the battlefield mattered. That's a scary thought to have in the back of your mind, and obviously an enormous amount of pressure if you're on the ground. Those boys weren't thinking about the larger picture, though. They were thinking about what was in front of them and all around them. They were surrounded by death and destruction like none else 
They were firmly in the grasp of the jaws of death, and there was no turning back. Even with all that planning that they did beforehand and all that preparation, there were problems from the get-go. The conditions were far from perfect weather-wise. There was a super thick layer of overclassed clouds that shrouded the view from the air on the ground, uh, and the current was way stronger than expected with very high winds and very rough seas. Eisenhower had already canceled the invasion once. He couldn't afford to do it again. So as the ships drew nearer, they began to drop anchor, and the men began slowly climbing over the sides into their landing craft. Many of them wouldn't be able to get in the seas. They were so rough. Uh, on more than one occasion, a sea swell would, would cause a soldier to lose footing, get thrown up in the air, and down into his steel bottom landing boat, and upon impact, he would break his legs. This cloud cover was so thick, too. Eisenhower actually agreed to permit what they called a clumsy form of uh, quote-unquote blind bombing uh, if necessary just to avoid hitting our own troops. It was hardly more effective than the name suggests. The pilots would use radar to pick up the shoreline and engage their targets from there. Not only that, but on the night before, on June 5th, he had issued orders for the bombers that were to bomb the beach before the infantry arrived to postpone their payloads. He wanted to postpone them 30 to 45 seconds in order not to hit the invading flotilla on accident. I mean, it was, it, was, it was hard stuff. These were conditions that only added on to a pile of issues that were working against the invaders before they had even begun. But they were able to stick through it and fight it out at 5.36 a.m. on June 6, 1944. The ships were anchored offshore and ready to begin their assault. It was precisely at this time that Allied fighter planes acting as spotters had identified muzzle flashes coming from the shore and they notified the navy below there was no more surprise it was time to light it up the naval bombardment of the norman beaches had begun and in a moment's notice there were suddenly 800 naval guns thundering across a 50 mile firing line sailors had to pack cotton into their ears it was such a massive display of firepower a reporter named Don Whitehead was there, and he said it felt like, quote, the air vibrated. Ernest Hemingway wrote about the murderous guns of the Arkansas and the Texas that, quote, they sounded like railway trains thrown skyward. Perhaps the best account of what it was like to actually be on one of those ships as they wreaked havoc towards the enemy comes from David K.E. Bruce, who was on, the, on board the Tuscaloosa. And he describes... There is a cannonading on all sides as well as from the shore. The air is acrid with powder, and a fine spray of disintegrated wadding comes down on us like lava ash. The deck trembles under our feet, and the joints of the ship seem to crack, creak, and stretch. Repeated concussions have driven the screws out of their sockets and shattered light bulbs. And for all that might and power, the preparatory bombardment of the Normandy beaches... Uh, for the American beaches at least, it only lasted about a half hour just so they could get on with the beach landings. In total, they fired 140,000 shells, but little was destroyed. Not, nevertheless, the GIs were about to go and see it for themselves. So Omaha Beach is where we're going to spend most of our D-Day story because it receives a very, very burdensome difficulty for a liberation of it. The Canadian force was able to mostly, for the most part, um, walk onto the shore. I mean, I, some men didn't even get wet. The British troops had, you know, they had some fighting, but not really that that difficult of a time taking their beachhead. On Utah and Omaha Beach, which were the two American beaches, is where the bulk of G German defenses were housed. And the GIs were, they went right up to the door and, and they knocked on it. The Germans had prepared fearsome defenses for the Americans on Omaha Beach. There were 85 machine gun nests, which GIs later nicknamed murder holes, and that was more machine guns on Omaha than three times the amount of all the British beaches combined. Most of the obstacles and barriers the GIs found as the only source for cover on the entire beach were so densely mined, one Navy officer described them like huckleberries 
The shape of the land on this section of the beast also made it particularly deadly. The landscape offered the ability for the defenders to lay down both plunging and grazing fire so they could go side to side and up and down. The GIs coming onto the shore essentially had nowhere to hide. American intelligence, which was normally pretty much spot on, had predicted one battalion of weak and inexperienced defenders. They failed to detect the hidden artillery guns that the Germans used at will against the GI invaders, as well as the amount of troops that were going to be there. If there had been one battalion, it wouldn't have been that difficult to take. But General General Erwin Rommel, the tactical mastermind that he was, had foreseen a weakness in the line and reinforced Omaha Beach with two veteran and battle-hardened battalions right behind him. What was supposed to be a 3 to 1 ratio in favor of American forces ended up becoming a 3 to 5 ratio weakness. The men that were walking onto those beaches were up against every single odd that they could have possibly faced. And then they landed on the beach. One of the things that made Omaha Beach exceptionally more dangerous and difficult to capture was the amount of beachhead exits that that particular strip had. There were only five ways off the beach. This allowed German defense to concentrate all their firepower on only five narrow thoroughfares instead of spreading out to defend a plethora of exit routes like the other beaches. Now, like I've mentioned several times already, it's impossible to know what it was like on that beach unless you were actually there. Rick Rick Atkinson writes, For those who outlived the day, the memories would remain as shot-torn as the beach itself. They remembered waves slapping the steel holes and bilge pumps choked with vomit from seasick men, making utterly inhuman noises. They remembered machine gun bullets puckering the sea like wind-driven hail before tearing through the ground-driven boats so that, as one sergeant recalled, men were tumbling out just like corn cobs off a conveyor belt. And that was just from the machine gun firing. The mortars were often the most terrifying thing that soldiers had to deal with because there was no real way to be safe from them. Mortars and artillery would, for those who aren't familiar, be shot high up and then essentially just fall down and explode on impact, and they would spew shrapnel in every direction. The only way to be relatively safe from it was to be in a hole underground because the shrapnel wouldn't touch you there. You know, you can't go through the ground. The thing in the back of every soldier's mind, though, was would they be lucky enough to not have a shell land directly in their hole? Mortar fire on the beaches of Omaha spewed fragments, quote, said to be the size of shovel blades that would skim the shore, trimming away arms, legs, and heads off the men that were on the beach that day. Essentially, part of the most terrifying thing was you didn't know if someone was going to fire at you because mortar men were, you know, sometimes a mile away. It was just luck of the draw. You just had to wait it out and hope for the best. The contrast of these men from before the landing to how they were on the beach was startling. Quote, soldiers who had sung Happy D-Day, Dear Adolf, now cowered like frightened animals. And these men had no escape. They desperately gouged out shallow holes in the shingle with mess kit spoons and bare knuckles. Their mouths were wide open with a look of astonishment, as they were instructed to do, intended to prevent artillery concussions from rupturing their eardrums. The men that were there that day remembered brave men advancing on the beach as if walking in the face of a real strong wind, all affecting the same tight grimace until whip-crack bullets cut them down. Above the battle din, they remembered the cries of comrades ripped open. BBC reporter David Howarth described the screams and sounds of these men as they lay dying in pieces on a beach far from their home. He described that sound as, quote, a long, terrible, dying scream which seemed to express not only fear and pain, but amazement, consternation, and disbelief. The men that were on the beach that fateful day remembered the shapeless dead sprawled on the strand like smears of divine clay, or as flotsam on the making tide, weltering with their life belts still cinched. 
carnage that these men witnessed and the fear that was unavoidable is truly beyond the point of our understanding today. These men were so stricken with fear, they were like statues stuck in place. Even as all their training and fellow soldiers would remind them to get off the beach, they were paralyzed with fear beyond comprehension. In order to help create and widen the exits from the beach, there were Army and Navy engineers that were supposed to land three minutes after the initial wave. And of course, like the rest of the invasion, little went right for them. Uh, I mean, some of them landed nearly a mile and a half away from their intended zone due to current or navigator error. In some of these boats, or I'm sorry, in one of these boats, an 88 millimeter shell hit Team 14's landing craft, quote, blowing the coxswain overboard and slaughtering the vessel's entire Navy demolition squad. One man's lower trunk and severed legs were described by a seaman as sticking up in the water like a pitiful V for victory. Men were so fear-struck that they sheltered behind German obstacles, quote, like clusters of bees, even as the engineers were screaming, kicking, and threatening to blow their charges anyways. By 7 in the morning, only 6 of the 16 gaps that were intended to be cleared had been opened, and that cost more than half the engineers that were there that, were there that day. The death on that small strip of beach that day would be something that those men could never overcome in their nightmares for years to come. One master sergeant would years later recall, I can still hear those men calling for help over the noise. Machine guns were the part of the weaponry that the soldiers remembered the most. One man man said they sounded like a Venetian blind being lifted up rapidly, and that was perforating the beach, killing the wounded, and re-killing the dead. All 32 soldiers in one boat were slaughtered, including their captain. A lieutenant was shot in the brain, continued to direct his troops until a survivor recounted, quote, he sat down and held his head in the palm of his hand before falling over dead. Wounded men jabbed themselves with morphine and shrieked for medics, one of whom used safety pins to close a gaping leg wound. By 8.30 a.m., the invasion had stalled. The rising tide quickly began to return, quote, drowning those immobilized by wounds or fear. And what strikes me here as especially significant is the amount of fear that these men had was so great that some of them were drowned to death by a returning tide. They were so afraid they were paralyzed to the point that they drowned where they were because they couldn't escape the grip of the fear that they had. Think about that for a minute. I mean, that's just something I can't even fathom. The words of Captain Joseph T. Dawson of the 16th Infantry summarize this ordeal the best, as Atkinson points out in his book, quote, An hour earlier, Dawson had leaped from his landing craft onto Easy Red just as an artillery shell struck the boat, exterminating the 33 men behind him. And, as Dawson said, the limitations of life come into sharp relief, he later wrote his family in Texas. Quote, No one is indispensable in this world. After what seemed like an eternity, the engineers were finally able to use their long tube grenades, known as Bangalores, and give the men on the beach a route of escape. And that's really what it was. It was an escape rather than an advance. They just wanted to escape that hell that they were stuck in. At one of these cleared areas, the first man that ran through was cut down by machine gun fire. He cried for a medic, and then he sobbed for his mother until he died. And one aspect of this war that is so drastically different from other wars before it is the dehumanization. And I mean that in the sense that revenge killings, they were not only common, but widely accepted as normal. When some of these men got through one exit on Omaha Beach, the fighting had mostly subsided. A German soldier came out of a pillbox and feigned surrender, throwing a grenade from his his raised arm disemboweling a ranger lieutenant and killing him. The dead officers and rage men not only killed the killer, but each man reportedly shot the corpse six or eight times as they filed past. And that's just a mild example of the revenge killings or the revenge or vengeance of these actions that occurred in this war. More famously associated with this idea is the way that the Nazi army raped and murdered their way to Russia and the way that the Red Army 
who was encouraged to do so by officers and politicians in the Soviet Union, responded by raping their way back to Berlin. And this idea of humanity as something that didn't even matter, or even just basic human treatment to other people, whether or not they were civilian or soldier, it's what makes this war so much different than any other war in the history of mankind. There's a very famous soldier who took photos throughout the war, and his name was Robert Kappa. I watched a documentary about how he took some of the most iconic photos of the war. Not a single one was staged, as they often were back then. And the documentary ended with Kappa telling this story about the last photo that he took while he was over there. He said it was the only thing throughout that entire war experience that he wishes he had never seen. So this was after the war had ended, the fighting was over, he came upon a woman who was dead on the side of the road, and the sight that he saw was this woman who had been, uh, she sympathized with Nazis and was a known supporter, I believe she slept with a couple Nazi soldiers, she had been raped by several men, and when they were done raping her, they killed her, and they killed her by stabbing a bayonet into her vagina. Kappa said of that ordeal, it was the first time that what he saw made him physically sick to see. And once he had come to from vomiting, he raised his camera to take a picture, but he said he couldn't do it. It was too brutal a sight to put on film, and he pulled the woman's torn dress over her waist to cover the scene and give her some respect. As he was walking away, he stopped, and he remembered why he had been taking picture after picture after picture from the beaches of Normandy through the Ardennes Forest and the Battle of the Bulge, it was to document and to let us know now, in the future, what this war was like. He said he turned around, pulled the dress back the way it was when he got there originally, and he took one single picture. I tell that story not just for shock value, but it lends an explanation of why studying these events is so crucial to our understanding for today. The most important part of history is context. If we can gather context for this war and these experiences, we understand things differently and in a way that will help us to understand the present. The way that humans treated other humans in this war was one of the most terrible acts of our history as a species. I just hope studying the context of this war allows us to never repeat that mistake again. But let's get back into the story. So the only thing working against the American invaders once they got past the beach, as far as France itself, obviously there were Germans, were the hedgerows. Rommel himself noted that for the Americans, France would be a conqueror's paradise because the people of France helped the Americans every chance they got. So once the invasion moved off of the beach, the only natural obstacles the Americans really had, as I said earlier, is the hedgerows. And these were century-old entanglements of vines and brushes and bushes that provided borders to land plots and shelter from high winds for agriculture. These would be sometimes as high as 10 feet and as thick as the length of an outstretched man. These things were so thick that not even an American Sherman tank could break through these hedgerows, and if they did, they would expose their soft and unarmored underbelly to crippling enemy fire. In one stretch of four by six miles, there were 2,000 such irregularly shaped fields, all with hedgerow borders. And the Germans took full advantage of the defensive abilities of these hedgerows. There were ancient wagon tracks that provided exceptional ambush spots. They could not be seen through, and the American planners had a total failure Uh, to understand the terrain that they were going to be fighting in after the beach. Normally, progress for an advancing army is measured in miles, how far you go per day in miles. With the army in this situation, with these hedgerows, progress was measured in yards. The reason that these were such an obstacle is because within each of them, it was just open field, just farmland, that's it. They were able to use, the Germans were able to use these hedgerows defensively, knowing that the Allies wouldn't be able to get through them easily. And once they were in an expansive field, they were then gunned down mercilessly, mercilessly by pre-sighted machine gun nests. I mean, some of the most gruesome fighting of the war was in between these hedgerows. Rommel, 
was particularly concerned, though, with the Allied position in their progress once off the beach, saying to one of his generals, If I was commander of the Allied forces right now, I could finish off the war in 14 days. Needless to say, that wasn't the case, but his statement reflects just how poor off the Nazis, Nazi defenders were once they were fighting off of the beach. Now, one of the things that made the invasion actually successful was the complete element of surprise, so much to the point that even when paratroopers were jumping in, jumping on the land from the, these planes, even still they didn't think it was the, the invasion. Thanks to Allied jamming and down phone lines, there was little known um, with certainty as far as the Germans were concerned. So, I mean, somehow thousands of ships had crossed the channel undetected. There were no Luftwaffe, which is the German Air Force, um, reconnaissance planes that had flown for the first five days of June, and naval patrols that would have caught them on June 5th were scrubbed because of the bad weather. They even had a decoded radio message. It was intercepted about the time the 101st Airborne launched from England. It suggested a poss possible invasion within 48 hours, but uh, an, it had an advisory on Monday evening from one of the German headquarters for Western Europe declared, there are no signs yet of an imminent invasion. Besides Rommel, two of the top four German commanders in the West had been away from their posts on Tuesday morning. Several senior field officers in Normandy had driven to Rene in Brittany for a map, ep map exercise. The 15th Army, which was stationed near the Pas de Calais, was placed on full alert before midnight, but the other major component of Rommel's Army Group B, which was the 7th Army, um, also occupying Normandy, sounded no general alarm until 1.30 in the morning, despite reports of paratroopers near Caen and in the Cottonin. Even then, one of the OB West headquarters insisted at 2.40 in the morning, it is not a major action. And it wasn't until that fantastic armada of ships materialized from the mist that the truth struck home. In subsequent hours, the German Navy remained supine. Uh, so too was the Air Force. Luftwaffe pilots were suppo supposed to fly up to five daily missions each to disrupt any invasion, but German aircraft losses in the past five months had exceeded 13,000 planes, which was more than half just from accidents and non-combat causes. Air Fleet 3, responsible for Western France, had just 319 serviceable planes, and that was supposed to be facing nearly 13,000 Allied aircraft. I mean, they were just, they were impossibly outnumbered. On D-Day, they would fly one uh, mission for every 37 flown by the Allies. That's, that's staggering. Of the mere dozen fighter bombers that reached the invasion zone, 10 dropped their bombs prematurely. German soldiers now bitterly joked that American planes were gray, British planes black, and Luftwaffe planes invisible. Even still, the 7th Army had asserted through much of the day that at least part of the Allied landing had been halted at the water's edge. Quote, the enemy, the enemy penetrating our positions was thrown back into the sea. The 352nd Infantry Division reported at 1.35 p.m. That soap bubble delusion soon popped. At 6 p.m., the division acknowledged unfavorable developments, including Allied troops infiltrating inland and armoring spearheads that were nosing through. I mean, this is this is just a a weird way for them to respond. Why? I don't know if it was from fear of the Fuhrer that he would get mad at failure, or or just overall pride, but they were just flatly denying what was happening in front of them. And maybe this was because of the Atlantic Wall. Um, you know, it had uh, 20,000 coastal fortifications. It had placed 500,000 foreshore obstacles and 6.5 million mines uh, in what Rommel called the zone of death. To Lucy, his wife, he wrote on May 19th, the enemy will have a rough time of it when he attacks and ultimately achieve no success. Hitler agreed, actually, with him and declared, once defeated, the enemy will never try to invade again. There was a lot of argument about how to best defend against this this coming invasion they all knew was going to come. They just didn't know where or when. Uh, General, I'm sorry, not General, Field Marshal Gerd von Rundstedt, who called um, 
Rommel an unlicked cub and the Marshal Laddie, argued that to disperse counterattack forces along 1,700 miles of exposed Atlantic coastline would be foolhardy. Better to concentrate a central mobile reserve near Paris that was able to strike as a clenched fist. Whenever the invaders committed themselves, they'd be able to attack. He thought it was uh, better to follow Napoleon's dictum, uh, which I'm not even going to attempt the French, but it, it meant engage the enemy and then we shall see. Hitler eventually made a decision that really didn't please anyone. He put frontline forces on the coast under the status of fighting to the last man. It's a phrase that's so easily uttered by those who are far from the trenches. And then he split up the other remaining forces throughout Paris and France. He even that morning had ordered troops to go to Italy to reinforce uh, some troops there. Uh, Neither Rommel nor Rundstedt were able to give orders directly to the Navy or the Air Force, which were vaguely, I mean vaguely, uh, ordered to cooperate with ground troops. One of the reasons for the success of D-Day is that 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 armored division, the Panzer Group West that was stationed in Paris, they didn't mobilize for eight hours. They did not move towards Normandy for eight hours because Hitler was the only person who could give them an order. It, I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. I don't understand how you run an army like that for that long. But these were the delusions of a mad, <clears throat> pardon me, a madman. Um, Hit, Hitler told his staff officers if the invasion was repelled that perhaps the West would, quote, come round to the idea of fighting side by side with a new Germany in the East. The onslaught that happened at the Atlantic Wall would be the most decisive battle of the war. He had predicted a few weeks earlier the fate of the German people itself is at stake. His fate, too. And if he had not just listened to Rommel just a few weeks earlier, they probably would have repelled the forces. He gave orders to uh, his, his field commanders six weeks before the invasion happened, quote, The enemy will most likely try to land at night and by fog after a tremendous shelling by artillery and bombers. They will employ hundreds of boats and ships unloading amphibious vehicles and waterproof submersible tanks. We must stop him in the water, not only delay him. The enemy must be annihilated before he reaches our main battlefield. And he was spot on correct with that. If Hitler had just listened to his most tactically brilliant field marshal, this this could have been a different story. But, as we often see in history... That just wasn't the case. All said and done at the end of D-Day, on the end of that evening, the Americans or the Allies had eight assault divisions now ashore. They suffered 12,000 killed, wounded, and missing, with thousands more unaccounted for, most of whom had simply gotten lost in the chaos. Allied aircraft losses in the invasion totaled 127. The 8,230 U.S. casualties on D-Day included the first of almost 400,000 men who would be wounded in the European theater, the first 7,000 amputations, the first 89,000 fractures. Many were felled by 9.6 gram bullets moving at 2,000 to 4,000 feet per second or by shell fragments traveling even faster. Atkinson writes, such specks of steel could destroy a world cell by cell. As for the wounded that were laying on the beach that evening, nothing was being done for them as there was no plasma or blood and they lay there being bombed and machine gunned all night long. On Utah Beach, handkerchiefs draped the faces of the dead because, as a Navy lieutenant said, they do not seem to matter as much with the faces covered. Omaha was, of course, the worst. Stretcher bears with blistered hands carried broken boys down the bluff to easy red sector of the beach that had now been nicknamed Dark Red, only to find that a medical battalion had come ashore with typewriters and office files, but no surgical equipment. Fearful of mines and rough surf, most of the landing craft refused to pick up casualties from the beach after dark. A single ambulance with cat's eyes headlights crept along the dunes, delivering the wounded to collection point trenches where medics plucked scraps of boot leather from their mine wounds. 
They listened for the telltale crackle of gas gangrene. They hushed sufferers who asked only for a bullet in the brain. One soldier returning to the beach for ammunition found many comrades, quote, out of their heads. There were men crying, men moaning, and there were men screaming. Others were beyond screams. Dead men lay in windrows like swollen grayish sacks. One reporter wrote, I walked along slowly, counting bodies. Within 400 paces, I counted 221 of them. More than double that number would be gathered on Omaha, which was 487. Their toes sticking up towards the stars of this as if they were in line for a parade drill. One Navy lieutenant wrote that one came up on them rather too suddenly and wanted to stare hard, but there was that feeling that staring was rude. And just as it had started, the day was over. It was legendary very quickly, and perhaps indeed in the judgment of the Royal Air Force history, quote, the most monumentous in the history of war since Alexander set out from Macedon. Hitler had spent four years building up the defenses for that Atlantic wall, and he had given command to his most charismatic and most promising general, and yet the, def yet the invaders only needed three hours to get through the defenses and breach the beach. In the New York Times, the headline was, We have come to the hour for which we were born. Uh, another editorial declared, We go forth to meet the supremest of our arms and of our souls. One man said, I shall never forget that beach. And that same soldier, who was Corporal William Preston, he wrote about one dead soldier that he always had stick out in particular. He wrote, quote, I wonder about him. What were his plans to never be fulfilled? What fate brought him to that spot at that moment? Who was waiting for him at home? Destiny had sorted them, and it would sort them again and again and again until that hour for which they were born had passed. Now, it wasn't long after this that the Allied forces were pretty much reaching Paris. Of course, there were some battles in between. But just as the Allies were reaching Paris, the Red Army troops in Poland overran the first concentration camp at Majden, Maj, Majdanek, sorry, where tens of thousands, tens of thousands had been murdered. One New York Times reporter wrote, I have just seen the most terrible place on the face of the earth. Other journalists who had accompanied the Red Army described machines that were grinding bones into fertilizer. This is German food production, a Soviet officer explained. Quote, kill people, fertilize cabbages. Photos of Zyklon B, which was the poison gas used in the gas chambers uh, shortly after, appeared in Life and Time, published a vivid account of a warehouse containing 820,000 pairs of shoes taken from inmates. Quote, boots, rubbers, leggings, slippers, children's shoes, soldier shoes, old shoes, new shoes. In a corner, there was a stock of artificial limbs. Other storerooms would contain piles of spectacles, razors, suitcases, and toys. The evidence did give weight to Roosevelt's recent accusations of deportations and, quote, the wholesale systematic murder of the Jews of Europe. Although it was not until the camps in Germany were uncovered in 1945 that the world would understand the full horror clearly. In truth, a soldier didn't really need to look that far to know what he was fighting for. Markers on allied graves all over Normandy contained that most stirring of epitaphs, more pour la liberté. He died for liberty. After viewing a military cemetery near saint mary Glis, a soldier on August 28th scribbled lines from A.E. Hausman in his diary, quote, The saviors come not home tonight. Themselves they could not save. At the Lacombe Cemetery, Don Whitehead listened as a French girl read a letter to a dead soldier from his mother. My dearest and unfortunate son, on June 16th, 1944, like a lamb you died and left me alone without hope. Your last words were to me, Mother, like the wind I came, 
and like the wind I shall go. Those who made it off those beaches and to Paris, they would continue marching and marching and marching. They marched from the beach, they marched through towns and villages and cities, and they marched all the way to Paris. It was just a couple days after this that the famous Arc de Triomphe, where you'll it was a stamp in the country at one point, but they basically had a big parade through Paris where Charles de Gaulle, the president of France, who who was a self-titled hero of the French because he tucked tail and ran and let the Nazis take over, uh, he wanted, this is one of my favorite stories, he wanted, let me get this correct, two entire United States divisions as, quote, a show of force against communist and other troublemakers because he was a pompous asshole and he didn't know how to control his own country. He asked Eisenhower for that, basically to keep order because he couldn't. Eisenhower was bemused and he agreed to half of that. And they went, they polished up their brass and cleaned their uniforms and that's where the iconic um, photo was taken under the Arc de Triomphe, where they marched down the Champs-Élysées with a sight so grand that its image soon appeared on a three-cent postage stamp. Beyond Paris to Saint-Denis, they marched through the rolling meadows of the Ile-de-France, past stone churches and beetroot fields. Marching as blue shadows grew long, marching in pursuit of the foemen fleeing east, marching marching, marching. They were always marching towards the sound of guns. From this point onward, most of what the Allies were struggling with was what Atkinson put in his book as the beginning of conflict in the high command. General Montgomery, who was the head of the British forces, was a pompous asshole, to put it so lightly, that's what he was, who simply wanted his his glory, didn't care about anyone else. He would publicly uh, speak out against Eisenhower, against FDR, against anyone who was not British, and he would he would bemoan their plans, and he would he would undermine them at every opportunity. Uh, he actually had Winston Churchill dub him a field marshal and gave him a fifth star, which was not even a rank then just because Eisenhower had four stars. And it's that kind of man that got thousands and thousands of men killed because he was a arrogant bastard who only cared about himself. And I am being harsh on him. He was a very good tactician. But because he was an arrogant bastard, he came up with the plan of Operation Market Garden. It was a simple enough plan uh, they had a Air Force dropping of, uh, I can't remember how many off the top of my head, a couple divisions or a division of paratroopers. He had them spread over 50 miles, which is just insanely stupid. You can't spread a force that that thin. And then they would be followed up by um, a land force that would come in from behind. And really the reason for Market Garden is because he just wanted to have a plan to invade Germany. That was his goal. And this was going to be going through Holland. So Field Marshal Montgomery wanted to be the name that came up with the plan to invade Germany. Because if you missed it before, like I just said, I'll say it again, he was an arrogant bastard. And he came up with this plan to attack the weakest part of Holland, where there was expected to be less than 3,000 troops who Montgomery suggested would fall over at the mere sight of the approaching British force. It's just a ridiculous thing to think. And I'm kind of going off on a tangent, which is not the goal of this World War II, this Part Two episode, but I'm, I'm telling the brief brief overview of this story because I think it is important. Basically, Montgomery made a really terrible plan. He made a really, really bad plan. No one liked it. 
um, General Beetle Smith from the American side, he went two days before Market Garden started, and he brought up some legitimate concerns with with this plan. And he didn't even do it because he, he knew who Montgomery was. He didn't do it in a way that was saying your plan sucks, but he did it in a way that says, hey, here are some legitimate weaknesses. We have to uh, make sure we account for this. What if we even had this section of troops move ahead to assist the paratroopers going in first? Montgomery literally laughed him out of the tent and dismissed him uh, as as less intelligent and unimportant. And, and that attitude is what cost thousands of thousands of people's lives because this man wanted his name um, on the top as the signature of the plan that got him into Germany. Even the privates down to the very lowest private in the army knew that this plan was stupid and it was going to kill people. But General Montgomery, he just had to have that plan and it killed thousands of, yeah, you guessed it, American troops that he sent in first without any cover and as it turns out, the reason it killed thousands of people is because he had them spread 50 miles long, marching through bogged swamps into Holland, where there were recent reports of incredible SS presence and tank presence. He insisted there was none of either, and they slaughtered those paratroopers. Of course, it was the 101st Division, the famous Easy Company is from that division, and and they were just cut down by machine gun fire. That was the biggest single battle, I guess, after, or the most infamous, maybe, after D-Day. There was, of course, the Battle of Antwerp, which was fascinating in its own right, but that's the, that's the story I tell you to try to highlight that these men, so many of them died, and they didn't have to. And that's, this, that's not just this specific case, it's throughout the entire war. So many of them died as they marched through France and into Germany. And there was just no reason for them to be there. And that's just a part of war, is just human error and human tactical misjudgment. What I do find fascinating is that these men were always marching. They were always marching, and they were always marching towards the sound of guns. Just like that Atkinson quote earlier, they were marching towards the sound. Not away from it, always towards the sound of the enemy guns. But before the march would reach Germany, the American forces would reach the Ardennes Forest in Belgium where they would have one of the most costly battles in the United States military history and where they would be bogged down for a terrible winter and face the largest offensive from the Nazis of the entire war, known as the Battle of the Bulge. And we'll pick up there on part three.